Hey, good morning there. Craig Davidson, Taurus Agricultural Marketing. Welcome to our uh, January podcast, What It Takes to Grow 100 Bushels of Crop, which is a very uh, probably intriguing uh, uh, topic. And, uh, you know, we're glad to have you with us this morning. Obviously, uh, you know, winter is slipping by in the midst of uh, a pandemic. It's amazing how days do do move very quickly on us, even though we haven't been out and about and, and socializing. But uh, yeah, we're glad to have you with us this morning. And uh, we're also grateful uh, to have uh, a guest with us today. Uh, obviously with me, uh, Mike Delinsky, our Director of Science and Innovation uh, from Taurus, as well as Ken King from King Agricultural Consulting from uh, Knee Hill uh, County area in Alberta. Uh, welcome, Ken. Thank you, Craig. Glad to be here and glad to join you and Mike this morning in our conversation. Yeah. Uh, maybe, Ken, if you want to just give us a little bit about yourself and a bit of history and, and uh, then we'll get into our conversation. Okay. Well, I've been um, in this area for 30 plus years. I've worked with uh, the fertilizer industry initially doing retail sales and then moved on to work for Alberta Agriculture. Um, was with them as uh, district ag for a while and then as a crop specialist and then in 1996 I decided to go on my own and I've been um, an independent uh, crop consultant in this area since that time. So um, I think if I calculate right this is probably about my 25th year in this area as an independent crop consultant. <laughs> Yeah, you're probably saying the days are flying by too, right? That's uh, yeah, they, when you're having fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Good, good. And, and Mike, obviously, yeah. I mean, this is a mini podcast now and uh, webinars that uh, you've been a part of and hosted. Uh, maybe just a quick intro for the audience. Yeah. That'd be great. Sure. Uh, I'm Mike Delinsky. I'm uh, with Taurus and uh, helping them in terms of developing new products and doing educational presentations like this and. Uh, I suggest that we get King because uh, Ken and I worked for Alberta Agriculture back in the old days and uh, and uh, Ken left and I stayed and then retired. But I still remember the the last time we were out in the field together, Ken, I came down, we looked at a Hessian fly problem just west of Trocher. That's the last time we met. And then when I saw Ken at the uh, 100 bushel canola contest, uh, we chatted and I found out he was the agronomist for the uh, individual who won the contest so i thought this would be a good time to hear what wisdom we can bring to uh, to some young coaches and some older coaches about how we actually looked at growing that uh, helping that farmer grow that crop yeah <clears throat> yeah so that yeah that's the basis obviously today i mean it's uh you know and i'll, I'll maybe just put a footnote in here you know i mean our our, our focus isn't to pursue yield per se i mean our focus has always been around agronomics and trying to help growers understand how to maximize the potential of their land but that also encompasses you know at the end of the day economics i mean we're not here just to pursue ultimate yield that's that's not the goal but the conversation today is more around around the pursuit of of knowledge and the pursuit of understanding of what is possible i mean what what is possible on our land and then we gotta we gotta massage that back to what 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 is the most economic approach that we can take and and ultimately uh you know i think all of that and that's the part of of what we'll dig into today is, is what are the some of the factors that we really need to dial in to to understand what our true potential is and 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 where we can take our production, all while focusing on maximizing, you know, economic returns for for growers across the country. And and you know, we're fortunate to have Ken because I think that that is the foundation and the fundamentals of of his business and his approach. Even even being a part of a Canola 100 Challenge, and we'll get into that. Um, but yeah, just just a, a footnote here that we don't want to see this as a let's just go after yield at any cost that's that's not the point of our podcast today it's about it's about understanding all the factors that we really got to become cognizant of and aware of to actually 
figure out what what is what is possible on our land. So with that, uh, yeah, Ken, maybe talk a little bit about you know, I mean, obviously the Canola One Hundred Challenge a few years ago, and you've been working in that area for for I'm going to say I hate to put you in a digital here, but decades. So you actually know know your growers and, and know the land very well and have spent years and years and years soil testing and tissue testing when this when this came about i mean this is a number of years ago now um what were some of the first things that you were looking to to actually start to say what where should we actually dial in or start our focus here on 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 100 bushels of canola which is which is crazy well i guess um you know, we looked, um, the fellow I was working with, Merle Clauston, uh, you know, we looked at um, this contest and, um, you know, the attitude that we had toward it was, it's possible. Um, let's see if we can uh, get involved and, and challenge ourselves to try to do something that we've never done before, which was grow 100 bushels of canola. Um, as everybody knows, um, no one in that contest did actually end up growing the 100 bushels. Um, we grew in the 50 acre trial site that we won the contest with. Uh, Merle, he grew, uh, I think it was 85.6 or 85.7 bushels. And um, the interesting thing to me was this, that although we picked what we felt was the absolute best portion of that field to do the yield test on, the overall average on that field at the end of the day was 84 bushels. So the field itself, the 157 acres, was not that far behind the 50 acres that we chose. Um, so the things we thought about in terms of field selection were, um, so fertility obviously was a big part of what we looked at. Um, the field that we used, um, actually in the three years, all fields that we used were recipients of manure either historically or in a very near time frame to when we seeded the canola crop. So this particular field, um, background fertility is extremely good because of a long-term um, manure application program. And um, as I uh, so, uh, just to give the guys an idea, um, it's a uh, uh, clay loam soil. 6.9% uh, organic matter, um, extremely high phosphorus levels, uh, like 195 parts per million, very high um, uh, for potassium, 906 parts per million, very good cation exchange capacity. We had high residual N, 68 pounds of N sitting in the background, and we have very high sulfur levels on that field. So we looked at it and we said, okay, that's a good choice from a fertility point of view. Um, in addition, it received some cattle manure and it received chicken manure, um, composted cattle manure, and then chicken manure application prior to us seeding and fertilizing. So, I mean, we set it up. We set it up from a fertility point of view and we selected very carefully where we wanted to go. Um, but we also looked at things like rotation. Um, I'm a firm believer that you need to have a good crop rotation. Uh, so. In this case, um, we had a crop that had um, three years of uh, cereal or other crop prior to us seeding the canola. And so um, we knew that we hadn't had any recent canola experience on that field, so rotation was part of it. Um, we looked at weeds um, and weed management. Was the field clean? Was there a lot of competition? Um, and, uh, you know, so we did things in advance of that crop to try to set ourselves up um, for producing, right? Um, so we had an edge application on that field prior to seeding. We looked at things like trash management. One of the things that I find when you're seeding canola, if your trash isn't evenly spread and you don't have an ability to get through that trash, you can really cause yourself some problems. We looked at things like when are we going to seed it? We seeded really early. Um, we seeded at a proper speed. We were very careful with the seeding depth. And I mean, everybody tries to do all of those things all of the time. And the only difference I would say is that we were 
probably a little bit OCD about it. Like we really paid super attention <laughs> as we wanted to go for that. You know, we we're going for the gold, so to speak. And then, you know, you always think about disease management. And that's why I talked about we had a decent rotation prior to um, the canola crop being seeded. So that's all part of the disease management package. But in crop, we, we looked after that as well. Um, okay. <clears throat> what was the organic matter again? Ken? Uh, yeah, we had a question on that. The organic matter on that field was 6.9%. So 6.9%. So in your, you know, we're going to, we're going to get into this and I'm showing right now, <clears throat> you're looking at a, a crop uptake and, and removal uh, chart here. And that this is, this is basis a hundred bushel yield. And so Mike, Mike has put this together and said at a hundred bushels, this is how many pounds of each nutrient it actually requires. And I'll show you another look at this too. I added another view of this, but Quick question to you, Ken. What, and then I'll get into some questions here for Mike. But what, when you build and you built a fertility program here, and and you put together a nitrogen recommendation for 100 bushels, which which you know when we look at this chart, that's 330 pounds of total night total pounds of nitrogen required. What was the uh, the factor for mineralization that you built? If we're saying 6.9 percent organic matter. What kind of calculation were you using there to say how much N are we getting out of that that uh, material? Well, um, usually, and in this case we did as well. Um, I usually use between four and five pounds of nitrogen mineralization from the organic matter. Really okay. is really dependent on rainfall. Um, I find that in a dry year we don't get that. In a wet year we probably get more. And yep. our our experience on this manure ground where we've got a good history of manure is in those years when you get that uh, extra rainfall, you get the extra yield. And uh, so, but generally speaking, I would use four to five pounds. So in this case, I was calculating probably around 35 pounds of nitrogen available from uh, mineralization of the organic matter. Okay. <clears throat> and that, and I mean, Mike, to your experience, I mean, that number may vary depending on your, climatic area and as Ken referenced obviously the amount of water we get the amount of growing degree days we get for the biological activity to to take place um you know would that would that be I guess would that be something you you two would uh, agree with well I'd probably expect more out of that to tell you the honest truth uh because your pH, I think, uh, in this case, was about six. So you had just about the ideal situation for release and management of nutrients uh, on that land. I guess the other thing that we've seen over the years is there's something magic about manure that nobody can lay a finger on. Because uh, no matter what the nutrient content of the manure is, you always get more than the nutrient content. And I think it could be related to the microbial activity. Uh, that occurs when you have that high manure. You know, there's so many important things. For example, when we talk about how much water we're going to use in a little while, when you have that much organic matter, Ken, I, I doubt you get a whole lot of runoff, and I suspect you get good percolation and and maintenance of that water that comes down out of the sky. And uh, I, I think it's also very interesting how you actually, as a as a professional agronomist, I see this webinar this kind of a, a way to show younger folks and people with maybe not as much experience the kinds of things that are required to in in terms of, of monitoring and communication with your clients to bring up the entire yield on that particular farm and I think those are are interesting aspects uh, to tell you the honest truth that you're doing that I haven't sort of heard about other people do mm -hmm. and I know if you want to uh, I know um, Craig, if you wanted Ken to talk about that now, but I think those are, are key background issues that allowed him to to actually produce that crop. Uh, Mike, can yes. I just follow up on your comment on the uh, nitrogen mineralization? Um, I agree with you. I think that we can expect more than what we um, what I'm calculating in my in my fertilizer recommendation process. Um, however, I, I like to uh, hedge my bets somewhat, and so 
Um, we generally calculate um, at the numbers that I used because we know that if we get a good rainfall year, um, that manure and the history, the fertility of that field, we are going to get a higher mineralization rate and we will get more yield from it. And it's proven itself that way year after year after year. Um, but we also know that if we get into a dry year, if we're counting on that, we really get ourselves into trouble. So we kind of, you have to draw a line somewhere. And so uh, we, we choose to draw that line with a certain amount of caution, I guess is what I'm saying. Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> so that's, you're, you're using a worst, not, not worst case, but you're actually saying, I want to make sure this is going to be there. And if we have some upside in moisture and mineralization or biological activity, then that's that's to the upside for the crop. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, in general, I would say that um, part of what what my responsibility is for these guys is to put them in a position where their risk is minimized on the fertility side of things. And so experience tells me that in the past, I know where we've said, man, we put out that 40 ton of manure, or we've done this or whatever, and then we count on that nutrition. And so we cut back on our fertilizer recommendations and we absolutely are counting on that. We sometimes got ourselves into trouble. And so right. we take a relatively uh, careful approach to uh, what we're doing with fertility and, and try to um, Try not to have the farmer spend a lot of money that he's not going to get a return from, but at the same time, have him not save too much money on the fertilizer side that he doesn't get the crop that he's expecting. Um, crops take nutrition. It's a simple fact of life. But um, all the nutrition we want to put out there, Mike alluded to it earlier, if we don't get the water, um, on that field, had we not gotten the water that we got that year, and had we not had the soil reserve of moisture that we had from the previous year, we never would have made that 85 bushels, never would have made it because we, the crop doesn't grow if it doesn't get the water. And so yeah. uh, um, I looked at I looked at that soil and uh, I mentioned the other day in our conversation, I'll just mention it here now, but we um, checked the soil moisture in the springtime and um, we had soil moisture basically to about uh, three and a half feet um, and pretty much like the year previous, we had 16 or 17 inches of rain and quite a bit of rain in the in the late period of the year. So um, we recharged the soil profile. We had good moisture going in and I calculated probably had somewhere between four and a half and six inches of stored moisture before we started to grow that crop. And then during the crop year, um, we had um, about 11 and a half inches of, of moisture during the growing period. So we're talking uh, 11 and a half and say, let's be conservative, say five. So say 16 to 17 inches of moisture available to grow that crop. So okay. uh, I think we utilized every one of those inches pretty well. <laughs> I would say so, and, and, and we'll hold that thought because we're going to show you some some detail and in, in water that's required to grow a bushel or b the, these types of bushels we're talking about. Um, you know, just I had a couple thoughts when we were talking about, you know, your upfront strategy. And, and, and I think one thing that you alluded to there, Ken, was really looking at the concentration of soil fertility as an important factor in trying to pursue or are really trying to isolate fields that had the potential you know you, you know and i always say there's a i mean we always struggle with this conversation between fertilizer and fertility but ultimately when we look at some of these nutrients that are immobile uh, you know in a lot of cases we we need to make sure we got that base level of fertility there in order to feed feed these aggressive plants and i call them like I mean, you're, you're basically raising, you're raising high performance athletes. That's what you're doing. But in order to do that, raise high, these high performance athletes, you're, you're kind of telling us that understanding the fertility of the soil was a key aspect to what you're looking at. Um, I would agree. Yes. Um, and, 
you know, oftentimes we get into this conversation with my clients about what it takes to grow a crop and how to build nutrition in the background, and all of those things. Um, but the reality is the land that you're farming is the land that you're farming. And so um, you need to understand where the strengths of that land are and where its weaknesses are. And part of the whole um, building an expectation for what a crop might be able to do is you need to understand what's what's the foundation and the foundation is the soil and so um, I've, I've talked to lots of guys over the years who say well how do I build my nutrition levels how do I build up what's happening in my soil so that I build that potential and my answer to them every single time is manure <laughs> go find somebody with manure right um, that's the quickest way to build that background fertility to build up the organic matter to add those nutrients that are so so key to this crop production but guess what we don't all have access to manure so as much as i'd like to say everybody go out and find somebody and get manure put on your land i can't do it and even in the area where i'm at where we have access to a fair amount of manure not everybody can get access to it so what else can we do so we need to understand the limitations that are there. And um, yes, you can build nutrition in your plant uh, through the addition of nutrients uh, through fertilizer, um, through um, using other strategies. But the reality is, is that base that you have to work with, you need to understand the limitations. And once you understand that, you know, is it reasonable for me to expect a 100 bushel canola yield? And I would say um, on the clients that I have and on the fields that I'm working on, um, we have a limited number of fields that I would say we can expect that from. Just because they may not have that foundation of nutrition and they may not have the ability in terms of water, um, just it might not be there. And so if a guy said to me, I want to grow 100 bushels of canola and I want to do whatever it takes to get there, um, my job might be to say, guess what, it's not going to happen. And, and yep. so but what can we do to give you the absolute best um, yield on that field from a economic point of view, from a sustainability point of view, from an environmental point of view, without doing any real harm, what can we do to manage that field in the best way to maximize what you're getting back and uh, to help you to do that? That's my job. That's what I do. Yep. <laughs> and it sounds like you do it very well. Yep. Which we need more more folks like you that are focused on the details, right? I mean, that's what it takes, and that's 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 what this conversation is about today. <clears throat> I'm gonna throw this back at Mike. I'm gonna throw this back at Mike here. Um, I I took his uh, his crop uptake and removal chart, which we just showed, and I actually added up the nutrients, the the main nutrients to total pounds in 100 bushels of of these individual crops. And it's almost like I'm taking a step back here, but basis what Ken has said maybe sometimes we kind of got to look at a different crop to say where do the economics lie basis the fertility we have basis the available water we have or or uh, you know potentially get over a 30-year average what what crop is the best to pursue yield and do it economically basis our nutrient complex and when I added these up you know you say holy it's it's and I don't want to look, make myself look smart because all I did is I just, I just calculated from Mike's chart. But, uh, you know, 100 bushels of oats, you know, you're looking at 30, 280 pounds of total nutrients. And I'm talking NPKS, calcium and magnesium. Every one of these crops typically takes roughly two and a half to four pounds of total micronutrient complex. So your zinc, manganese, copper, boron, iron, and, uh, so when I compare oats to what Ken did in canola, you know, 9,220 pounds of total nutrition required to grow 100 bushels, you say, wow, that is like, that's like scary, scary different, how much total nutrients is required to get to that 100 bushels on, on an acre. And so I'll throw this back to Mike and, and say, you know, so when we're, we're looking at fertility in the soil, um, you know, how do we bring this back to actually looking at crop selection and, and say, what, what might be the best rotation? Ken's big on rotation and so am I. What might be our best rotation basis now we know your soil and what we're working with? 
Well, you know, you, I'm glad you did this. We, we, a lot of times you don't have to <clears throat> like to have a lot of slides on podcasts, as you know. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is one that uh, is interesting because I talked about this frequently, and and there, there's one issue I want to bring up before we we get into that rotation, <clears throat> is uh, and and what has changed Western Canadian agriculture over the last uh, about 40 years has been the production of canola. Because this canola is a phenomenal weed. It can extract nutrients better than anything else we grow on a per bushel basis. And 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 I frequently talk about this. For example, a bushel canola takes a pound of phosphorus per bushel. When you've got 20 million acres of canola being grown now, virtually every year or more, we are removing nutrients and yields at a greater rate than we ever have from this land that we've been farming now for about 120 years. And is it any wonder that the recent results uh, that we got out of A&L would show uh, sort of a summary of uh, deficiencies in Western Canada, that nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur are now just blatantly deficient across the majority of the West along with nutrients such as boron and zinc and it's probably going to get worse over time simply because we're not replacing what we're pulling out and the soil has only so much to give so i often tell farmers it's and, and agronomists it's time that we started really looking at what we're pulling out and what we're putting back in so as a result here we can see now and you know it's it's, it's happening right now we've been pulling canola we've been pulling peas and we've been pulling flax, but you take a look at oats and barley now. We got a lot of guys who are saying, man, at the price of barley, I'm going to grow barley because I can do that. And look at how much nutrient I save and the risk I reduce and the growing season. So the, 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 you know, the rotation is important. For example, we know that peas, and it has to also do with, with rooting quality. Canola has a phenomenal root. Wheat has a phenomenal root. Corn has a, our peas have a peony root, actually a very small root system compared to those other two crops. So we always say, well, after peas, we can grow anything because it doesn't use nearly as much water. It fixes its own nitrogen. So we look at those kinds of things in selecting a rotation. But what's driving things now on the prairies is largely disease management with some of our pulses like lentils and peas. So the rotation now is being driven by some of these kinds of numbers and the nutrients that are required, by the kinds of growing seasons we're, we're getting, and the commodity prices we're looking at. Yeah. The rotation is <clears throat> perfect, and we need it for disease management, we need it for moisture conservation, we need some of these things for, in fact, extracting nutrients from depth. The one thing canola can do with that taproot is it can go down and it can get nutrients and water from deep in that soil <clears throat> profile like nothing else I've ever seen. Nope. So those are my comments in terms of rotation. Everybody's different. You know, as we look across the, the cation exchange capacities and the pHs that we're starting to, to start segregating between high pH and low pH soils, those kind of factors are now going to start to drive, in some regard, our selection of crops to deal with those kinds of issues. And salinity <clears throat> is ex expanding. We know that oats and barley can deal with salinity better than many other crops. Canola is pretty good. So I think going forward, it's not going to be as simple. We're going to be selecting the varieties we're going to need, plus <clears throat> what is happening in the, in the science world is that these issues are now driving breeding programs, utilization of genetics to incorporate genetics can, that can deal with heat stress, salinity stress, nutrient deficiencies. So there's my, my appeal uh, uh, relative to where we're going in rotations. And we need to have those rotations. Regenerative agriculture is coming on stream in a bigger way to look at intercropping and the utilization of multiple uh, rooting systems to access those nutrients. So the old days of you know wheat, canola, wheat, canola, and today actually we still got wheat, canola, wheat, canola in many areas <laughs> because we have very few options. 
we have yep. very few options. We can compete in the marketplace, and every time we get <clears throat> try soybeans, the darn weather goes dry, and soybeans <laughs> you know disappear for a few years until the farmers forget about that. So yep. you know, rotation is perfect, but you have to take into consideration all of these numbers and water. Yeah, and this might be. I mean. You know, as we're sitting here right now in the middle of January in 2021, it's, I mean, we're in a, a state where crop prices, obviously, you know, ending stocks are lower and demand is, is, is growing in a pandemic. But, you know, I would, I would argue right now, I mean, heading into this coming season, a number of these crops pencil, you know, pencil very well. And, and maybe some of the economics you build into your program come back to this mindset and say, what, you know, could I grow three times the amount of oats as I could canola because it takes a third of the amount of new total nutrition. Uh, and maybe Ken says, I'm going to select these fields here for that because, you know, the base nutrition isn't as strong and I'm going to put canola, start to change the mindset. Now, now we're thinking like growers where we say, geez, it's uh, it all comes down to economics, but putting it in this light, I also want to shed light on things like peas or lentils or soybeans and the value of, of biology here, right? To say, well, if in fact peas, if, you know, 40% of my total nutrition requirement could actually come from bio biology. So that, that's maybe something we need to leverage too in some of these, in these uh, situations, because that's, I kind of call that a gift, you know, and, and sure enough, we inoculate, we put on inoculants and we're, we're seeing more biologicals come into our cropping systems. Uh, but I, I would say that's an area where we need to leverage as well. And, you know, we're seeing potentially nitrogen fixing bacteria now for things like corn and and potentially our cereal crops and say, well, that's, man, we've got to learn about that. But that might help us as well as we pursue, um, you know, more progressive yields, but doing it in an economic fashion. I have a question for both of you here, just so you know, I... I have the total pounds of nutrients required, but then on the right-hand side of this, I actually show pounds of yield per 100 bushels. My question to you, when I compare the efficiency of, say, oats, barley, corn, spring wheat versus, say, peas, canola, soybeans, why am I achieving more yield with less nutrients than I am for peas, canola, and soybeans? <laughs> I'll, I'll give you my thought. Yeah, go ahead, Ken. Yeah. Well, I, my my thought is this, and you can correct me if I'm off offside here. But I, I'm looking at at the amount of combined nutrition required to build protein. That's right. So when I look at peas, canola, soybeans, like when we look at the concentration of protein in the grain. It is significantly higher than oats, barley, corn. So my my hypothesis is, is that it actually takes a tremendous amount of combined nutrition to actually build protein. Would that be? I don't I don't think you're too far off. Um, okay. You know, it, it's never it's never one thing, right? So you heard Mike talk about you know, rotation and nutrition and all of those things that are so important in what we're doing. Um, the reality is, is that uh, sometimes we let economics drive our decisions, right? And I totally get that. Like one of the biggest conversations I have with farmers all the time is this thing that Mike alluded to, canola wheat, canola wheat. And that's driven by economics. Um, farmers make money in that rotation. However, as Mike alluded, um, disease becomes a big factor in those things. So um, you look at what's happened with peas, for instance, in the Western Canada agriculture since the beginnings, um, the, the discovery of aphanomyces and the damage that it's done. Um, we talk a one in seven or a one in five pea rotation now. Um, you look at what happens when you get club root and it's moving everywhere in Western Canada. Uh, you get club root on your canola side of things. Then you start to talk one and four. I say to the farmers, why don't we talk that now rather than after we have the problem? Why don't we look at all of those things that affect our rotation like disease, 
And Mike, my argument is disease has been a huge part in rotation management from day one, like from way back in the beginning. 100 years ago, we learned about crop rotation, that if you stayed in a wheat, 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 eventually it caught up to you. And so what did we do? We started to add in other crops to prevent those things from happening. So one of the conversations that you need to have with growers is about rotation. And rotation not only from a um, nutrition point of view, not only from a soil health and regeneration point of view, because every crop has a different impact on that soil. Uh, we had one situation where we had a canola crop the one year and the grower chose that he was going to grow corn the following year. Well, corn, corn loves mycorrhiza, canola doesn't promote mycorrhiza. Guess what the impact was? We had a really highly deficient phosphorus corn crop because the mycorrhiza in the soil weren't assisting that corn and never thought about it till it was too late. And so sometimes you learn those lessons the hard way. And uh, um, Craig, you alluded to the biologicals, the activity of the uh, microorganisms and the biology that's in your soil is so critical to what that crop is gonna do. And yeah, we can assist, we can help, but we also have to be thinking about it. And in that case, the example I gave the corn after canola, we just never put the two pieces together till it was too late. And um, from a disease management point of view, I think canola one in three or one in four is an absolute must. But try to convince a farmer who's in, up against financial crunch that that's a good idea. Yeah, I think you're right. Protein, the world is fed on carbohydrates, not so much on protein. And 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 it is it's true that the more protein you need to build a plant. If you just look at the protein content of some of these crops, you'll see why. But I, I have a question for Ken because we're time fleets as usual. Because I think it, guys need to hear this. And and it's Ken. You need to say something about your monitoring system in terms of, of both tissue testing and soil testing and communication with your clients, which I, I really love when we we had a prep for this. I think that's important for for guys to hear. Okay, so um, tell me if I'm off track when you <laughs> when right. I get going here, Mike. Um, you know, you talked about your water, how you're managing water in your area before we got into people like crop intelligence with that. You know, your tissue testing, uh, your in-season foliar treatments to to supplement what you're finding with your monitoring program. Because if you don't monitor and you don't know what your crop is doing, it's darn hard to work at at fixing things or looking forward into the future is what I'm getting at. Yeah, well, I guess um, one of the things that we do, and, and we talked about this the other day, and I agree, um, is we soil sample. Um, we, I, I'm a firm believer that you need to know where you're starting from. Um, and so we soil sample um, every field every year, and it's just a routine thing that we do. And people say, well, you could get away with less than that. And I go, yes, we could. But no, we don't want to. And one of the reasons is, is I really like to know where we are to begin with. And I really like to know where we are compared to where we were last year and the year before and the year before and the year before. I was talking to my business partner yesterday and he mentioned to me that he's looked back over the last 15 years and he can track where our nutrition has gone on those fields based on the fact that we have the soil sample history. Um, so we soil sample, then we build a fertility program based on that but we just don't close the door and say our job's done. We're out there in those fields. Um, we're in the field uh, once a week, every, every week through the summer. Um, we're looking at what's happening in that crop. We tissue sample. Um, we take enough tissue samples to get a representative idea of how the fertility package that we've recommended is working for those farmers. And uh, so that means every farmer is going to see at least uh, a single tissue sample or more on every crop that they grow on their farm. Um, we use those to say, okay, based on the soil sample, we recommended this. What happens in that crop? Um, in the Canola 100 that year, we tissue sampled that crop every week from um, the time it was at the fourth leaf till basically it was so mature that it was too dry to, to tissue sample. And the reason we did that is we wanted to know where the nutrition was throughout that time period because we wanted to react to that if we needed to. And um, 
So that's part of what we do. We soil sample, we build a fertility program, we cross check that fertility program, but that doesn't mean we're ignoring everything else that's going on out there. We're in those fields we're looking for insects, we're looking for disease, we're looking for weeds, we're looking for how's that crop responding? Is it showing nutrient deficiencies? Is it showing problems? Is it not picking up water? Is there trouble underground? Do the roots have problems? Those are the things that we're looking for and we're giving farmers every time that we're in that field, the farmer hears from us. So if we're out there, we see something, he hears about it. If we're out there, we don't see anything, he hears about it. So part of our responsibility, I feel, um, and we built this from day one, is that we're in those fields once a week. We report to those farmers once a week. And we um, not only give them a conversation, but we also give them a written report of what we've seen and what our expectations are going forward. Um, what they need to be looking for, what they need to expect might be coming down the pipe um, so that they, um, um, they have some idea of what's coming. And uh, we have some idea of what's coming. And that's the conversation that's ongoing with those farmers throughout the growing season. At the end of the growing season, we sit down and we go, okay, what happened, right? How did it turn out? What was the yields? Where did we end up? Um, what are we happy with? What are we unhappy with? And then we start to build, okay, based on what we know happened this year, let's start to build next year. And we have all that information. Again, we got the tissue samples from last year. We got the soil samples from last year. We have all the crop reports all year long that say this is what happened or didn't happen. And then the farmer has that information. In the Canola 100, like I say, we, we tissue sampled that from the fourth leaf on um, every week. And basically, um, the nutrition was strong throughout the year. Um, there, uh, there was one point in time, actually there was um, one point in the year, and I'm just gonna have a quick look here, where um, we had a shortage of rainfall for a very short period of time. I'd say about, it was a dry period for maybe 10 to 14 days. And you could just track those mobile nutrients and watch them go down based on the moisture. But then we had a rainfall and bam, those ones that were all of a sudden looking like they're going to go deficient, bang, they were right back up again. Why? Because the soil had enough moisture to provide those nutrients back to that plant. So um, I agree, Mike. I think it's important that you, if, if, if I'm an agronomist or if I'm a young agronomist, the best advice I can give you is be in the field and be talking to your producers. Talk to your clients. Let them know what you're seeing. Let them know what they should be thinking about. <laughs> <clears throat> that's that's fantastic and i'm i'm with you i mean this isn't we're not talking about something easy we're talking about a real challenge and, and the pursuit of excellence essentially on on land and then you throw the environment in you know we always talk about abiotic stress and biotic stresses that you have to deal with it's like i think there's 70 roughly 72 factors that to essentially chip away at your yield from the day you put the seed in the ground to the day you harvest it. So aside from nutrition and water, I mean, there's lots of factors like disease and, and plant stresses that we have to try to figure out or manage to, to keep these, I always say, high-performance athletes moving in a direction to, to get to that finish line. So switching gears a bit, I, in the essence of time, you know, this is, this is one of the other key aspects that you know we look at and i know ken's alluded to a number of times here that you know when we talk, start talking progressive yields i mean we can't talk that way anymore without understanding water and available water and, and fair enough we can't control water in dry land agriculture but i would argue the better job we do of our balancing our fertility and, and keeping these plants healthy and actively growing I would argue the better job we do of maximizing the water or the water use efficiency. So I'll maybe let Mike talk to this a bit. This is his slide, and I know he's yeah. referenced this data from from Elston as well, I believe. Yes, uh, yes. This is this is stuff that Elston and uh, and Crop Intelligence used to to estimate uh, in some of their uh, uh, their systems uh, how much uh, yield potential you can get, and they give you that recommendation. So. Uh, it, you know, generally the rule of thumb is it takes about four inches to build a plant. So if you look at canola, it takes about, you know, and these are averages, the more efficient and the better balanced your fertility and less stress you have, of course, 
the greater uh, ability the plants have to, in fact, uh, increase the yield, yield because, uh, you know, the roots can't feed themselves. So when your roots are, are starving, uh, the shoot has to send all those carbohydrates down to keep that root surviving. And then, as, as Ken says, when the rain does come, bam, you get, you know, regeneration of root hairs and start extracting that nutrient back out of the, out of the plants. So this just gives you some idea. And, and what I mentioned, I've seen over 50 years that I've been involved in this and more so since I retired, uh, this canola plant uh, going into a drought and the first year a drought will do phenomenally well because those roots will go down and it can extract nutrients like a darn and it'll take up water, but it takes a lot of water to do this. You know, so, so this is just to give you a, a, a comparison about say barley. Or, so we're, we're, you know, in a dry year, when you're going into, you're coming out of a dry year and you're going into another dry year, you look at this and say, well, okay, if I'm gonna grow a crop and I grow canola, I need this much water, 4,100, you know, gallons per bushel, but for barley, I only need 1,600. So if I dried out my rooting zone really badly, I may wanna consider, man, I better put some barley in because I can probably grow a reasonable crop. I've got reduced risk. And if I'm into a drought, I know my canola has sucked that moisture down three, six, eight feet, probably. And what I tell farmers all the time and, and agronomists is a root doesn't want to go down any further than it has to because it costs the shoot a lot of cash and carbon to do that. So it goes down for water because without water, nothing works, nothing works. So the plant is driven by its access to water. And that of course brings along the nutrients with that water. And the other key thing is, remember that the microbes, the fungi, the, the protosomes, the, the whole works of, of things that in that soil system need the same nutrients as the plants do and they're fighting for that. Phosphorus, mm -hmm. all life needs phosphorus, and they need the water. So that's why water is, the drought is so tough on plants because everything just suffers terribly. It can't cool itself, it can't transpire, it can't get nutrients, it can't get anything. So some of these kinds of numbers just give you a, a little bit of a comparison. You know, peas will never get, you know, we're, we're talking 100 bushel peas and guys are getting their under irrigation. Peas with their root system, the demand of energy to put nodules on, we're not gonna feed the world on peas. We will feed the world on wheat and barley and rice, the carbohydrate producing things and corn. That's what mm -hmm. we'll feed the world on. The proteins come from this because it takes water for many of these poor crops and it takes a lot of nitrogen and a lot of energy to do that. So if this just gives you a comparison. You may wanna use if you're depending on where we're going this, even this year. I, I know yeah. guys are looking for barley seed, for example, right now. Well, yeah, and I would argue. Prices and water, maybe. All right. Uh, and I would argue as we, you know, as, I mean, agriculture is moving at light speed, obviously, both in technology and information. But, you know, and we had our call previous to this call, Ken said, you can't forget about the fundamentals that we've learned along the way. You know, how important we don't want to drop what we learned. And, and yet I say, if we take what we've learned so far and we start adding in understanding available water to that equation i mean th this is a high high stakes business today and there's a lot of risk that goes along with the pursuit of of production and uh not knowing available water or historical rainfall to build an overall program i say mo moving forward it, it's going to have to be part of the equation if in fact ken takes his growers and says you know I think we should be growing 110 bushels of barley, or I think we should be pursuing, you know, 85, 90 bushels of wheat, you know, and Ken said, I don't think you mentioned it here, but you said on that same field that grew 85 bushels of canola last year, the barley yield was, was what? Um, hundred and, um, I can just give me a second and I'll check that, but it was 148 or 154. I'm not sure what it was, but, um, okay. Give me half a second and I'll track that down. But, um, yeah. Uh, in fact, I have it right here. Just hold on a second. Yeah. Either way, I, I say this, this is important. Go ahead. One of the things going back to Mike's comment about the water, 
Um, in 2016, so before we grew the canola crop, we had barley on that field, Mike. So the least water using crop. We had 16 inches of rainfall in the crop year. Okay, what did we follow that up with? A high water using crop canola. But we banked water from the previous year this and year. I took advantage of it. Um, so when you talk about that water use thing and thinking about it, um, we didn't make use of all the water in 2016 with that barley crop, but no. we certainly took advantage of it in 2017 with the canola crop. Um, so it was 148. Uh, Craig, you asked the question about barley on that field this past year. It was 148 bushels there. So um, okay. one, of the things, uh, one of the other things I want to circle kind of a little bit around back to is uh, one of the other things that I think as an agronomist to help your farmers, you need to be tracking this stuff we're talking about, rainfall, water. Um, that's one of the things that we do as well. Um, we have about 100 to 150 or so rain gauges scattered throughout the area that we consult in. And the reason we do that is to track what happens with rainfall. Because I've got guys who are in an area that I can guarantee they're gonna get the least amount of rain of anybody within Knee Hill County. And they have had that happen to them for the last 25 years. And so I can know that if, if grower A, who's in that area, is talking to me about producing 100 bushel canola, I already know that he's at a greater risk of not producing that than the guy down the road. And that applies to every other crop that he grows in that area. He has less water to build that crop on. So if, if his neighbor, 10 miles away is getting on average two to three inches a year more than he is, that's significant in terms of ability to produce. And it's important from my point of view to know that. Um, yeah. It's amazing. I would say. Right? Go ahead. No, I yeah. Just, I'm, I'll let you finish. I was just going to say, it's amazing the variability within short distances. And we think while it rained, not necessarily the same everywhere and yeah. that's important information to have so yeah and we're you know i'm with you we're excited about some of the technology that's coming our way to understand available water and you know i think that's a, a key aspect to managing you know production agriculture moving forward because we can't control it but we can we can manage it and i think that's one of the greater concerns across a broad market this year in western canada is the the bank of of available water going into 2021. I think you think our reserves maybe are have come down in some areas. They're definitely depleted, and so that may be a factor that goes into you know your overall uh, target yield. But I also say we start to look at maybe some management tools like split up of nitrogen to say, well, if our bank is low going in, maybe we manage our nitrogen up front. And if the rains come, we have an opportunity to come back in and, and uh, pursue that yield now that we have the, the available water to work with. So I think 2021 split up in some of these areas where we know the bank is, is lower going in, that might be a strategy that still allows us to stay on track to pursue the yield, but mitigate the risk by putting it in all up front, not knowing that we have enough water to, to get there. So. Yep. And we've got great tools to manage the distribution of nutrients through the season uh, now that we didn't have in the past. You know, there are, com there are you know considerations about cost of using some of those, but but we have we have abilities to stretch it out a little bit more than we used to in the old days where we would just put down NPK. We've got lots of formulations that can can help spread that along with four years now, and everybody's got high boy sprayers where you can dribble band on. You know some of the mobile nutrients like nitrogen or boron or, or or sulfur which can then be you know washed down into the soil zone so so it, things are a lot better for that now yeah so we not that i've been avoiding the questions here but there's a number of questions that we've kind of been alluding to obviously and uh, um you know i go back to there's a question around root size and nutrient uptake I, and I kind of call this the chicken and the egg, you know, it's, uh, you know, you can't have a strong, healthy rooting system without a strong, healthy plant, but, but what comes first, right? It's, uh, I think that's kind of the spot going back to soil fertility and soil tilth and soil health. 
if that's your foundation, you have a fighting chance to build a healthy plant out of the gate. And if you got a healthy plant, you probably got healthy biology because now the plant is feeding that biology carbon. But in turn, you're also probably producing a healthy rooting system. Would that be a fair way to look at it? I, I would sure, sure say so, you know, and, and one of my biggest concerns uh, uh, when I go across the prairies and have field days and take a probe and shove it in the ground is the development of compaction zones down in that, almost in the plow, plow zone there. So anything we do to inhibit root growth is going to affect your yield in the end, in my estimation. The two have to yep. communicate together hormonally, so it's a, it's a joint venture, a joint venture. Yeah. yeah. And that, just to follow up with what Mike said, I would agree, and, and you you alluded to it earlier, Mike, when that crop root system is suffering, the plant turns around and it sends carbohydrates and nutrients back down. So that means basically that the top end of the plant stops what it's doing to keep the root alive, because that plant's in survival mode. So the minute that plant has available moisture, has available nutrition, those roots get healthy again, then what happens? The top end grows. So if we can maintain a healthy bottom end, the root system healthy, contributing to that plant, then the top end is going to do better. So absolutely, they go hand in hand. If you can't grow roots, you can't grow top. You can't grow crop. Um, you have to have that healthy root system. You know, and we're learning more. We we know now that that the roots basically control, in some regards, the the activity in the rhizosphere by the exudates that is putting into that rooting zone. And, and I'm, I'm relatively convinced that canola is, is maintaining a different group of, of microorganisms and fungi and so on that rooting zone than wheat is, than peas are. Uh, we just can't figure it all out because through evolutionary and over time, we know that these relationships have been bonded genetically in many cases. Now we're getting into looking at things like endophytes that are now developing partnerships like mycorrhizae and rhizobium do. We just never could understand how this was taking place. And, and now with science, we can actually figure this out. And we're, and as Craig mentioned, we're, we're being, bar, being bombarded with microbial kinds of products that are coming down the pipe and biostimulants that are usually organic based to some degree. And we're just at the verge of, uh, you know, the leading edge of understanding this as far as I'm concerned. Well, yeah. and just to, just to add to what you're saying there, Mike, I think that the um, focus on this regen agriculture is about soil health, and soil health is the microbial and um, larger organisms that are in our soil that interact with our plants. And so the things that the regen agriculture focuses on is to um, improve that soil plant relationship by maintaining actively growing roots and maintaining that, that relationship for a longer period of time. So that's companion crops, that's cover crops, that's all of those things that they're focusing on. The reason they're doing that is about our microflora. It's about the creatures that live in our soil. And it's about improving that relationship with our plants. And so very, very important. Um, the uh, biology of our soil is critical to what that crop's gonna do. And um, we talked about it a little bit earlier with the mycorrhiza and the canola and the corn thing. Every plant is different in terms of who he's looking to partner with in that soil. And so what we can do, anything we can do to maintain that biological activity in terms of that crop doing well. Anything else, yeah. Greg? Yeah, I was gonna, you know, I will get to basically wrapping it up here, but I, you know, I would say too that the pursuit of yield, we talk about the amount of fertility is required. And, and I come back to this fertilizer versus fertility. It, it's a tough thing. And, and today I would say, as we pursue yields, we have to start looking at managing the salt load that we apply as well, because it's, uh, you know, we talk about how important these roots are and the conductivity of the soil and the biology. But if we prune off the roots up front, or if we stress out that plant up front and it goes through this phase of days or weeks of stress because of salt load, you say, we're trying to do the right thing by adding more fertilizer, but we could be also hindering ourselves because of abiotic stress we're causing. You know, I think it's called fertilizer because it's nutrients with salt. I mean, if we can figure out how to bring fertility, you know, nutrients without salt, then we can probably see more effectiveness, uh, 
with those applications in a year of applying it, even on fields that have lower levels of background fertility. So it's all connected. And that's why it takes people that are smarter than me. That's why I say you want to, you know, you want to be the dumb guy in the room. That's why I surround myself with Mike and Ken so you can learn. Right. And that's, uh, but it's, it's, it's at this level, the complexity, the risk that's required, but it, it, to me, it's the attention and the detail uh, to get there. So yes, roots are important. Um, disease management is important, but I, I would argue too, uh, aside from some of these diseases that are widespread, plant health is always your first line of defense. You know, a strong, healthy plant that has adequate levels of nutrition always is going to be your first line of defense to disease, um, versus just trying to put a band aid on it and say, well, I've always, I always have disease. I'll just put on a fungicide. Well, fair enough. It can bring value, but maybe figure out why you're always getting disease. Is it a nutrient imbalance that's actually causing that plant to always be susceptible to an attack? Um, You know, I I just listed some things here in kind of a summation slide. Uh, One thing I don't have on here is actually rotation and disease management that Ken alluded to. But if we are going into uh, understanding how we can, you know, increase our yields, effectively and economically. I think all these factors come into play when we look at our our fields, we look at our soil, even looking at areas within a field that could be holding us back. And heading into 2021, uh, you know, agriculture's, it's exciting. It's as exciting as it ever has been. Um, But that doesn't mean we don't stray from the fundamentals of crop production and, and all these factors that we that we have to look at to uh, to be good stewards and and be uh, progressive enough to help our growers get to that that next level of economic achievement. So, um, what do we got for time? Ten o'clock. Uh, just to sum up, any fi- final uh, comments or closing statements that you'd want to make, Mike? And then I'll get to you, Ken. Uh, not, not really. I, I think I think Ken is the the wizard in the group here today, so uh, I, I want to leave him time. Time. I mean, the 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 thing is, you know, we, we're all, everybody's looking for the the silver bullet. Uh, it's always about the silver bullet and what the neighbor maybe did, and you know what the neighbor did. In most cases, hasn't got any relevance to you, depending on how he farmed it and water conservation and so on. So, so I always tell you. Know, Think about what's going on. Try new things on, on a small basis initially if you're worried about it. You know, uh, look at, at something different. Talk to people who know stuff. Uh, get educated. The future of, of farming is going to be more about understanding. We've got the hardware now. When farmers love hardware, there's no doubt about it. We've got the hardware. Uh, Integrating all of this is very complex and we're getting computer systems, you know, and I, I go back to crop intelligence, which, you know, we've had yield monitors on combines for years, and nobody uses the information. We've had moisture monitors for years, but nobody could figure out what to do. So it's going to be easier for farmers to make decisions, uh, but it's going to be complex and you may need an agronomist down the, down the road for that. But don't be afraid to try things, but at the same time, be cautious. There's a lot of stuff out there that I think you want to be cautious about when you're making those decisions. You know, use rational sense, get some advice, and uh, and on progress slowly. Uh, most of you guys are, you know, the older guys are moving through the system. There's a lot of young guys coming into farming now. It's great to go to meetings and see young guys. You know, you younger guys, if you're you're farmers in this business or listening on this, you've got time. You know, your dad maybe had that farm and he did things his way for, you know, his, his generation. You're going to be exposed to stuff we can't even think about in your lifetime going forward. You know, yeah. so, so move slowly, you know, be cautious. There's a high risk game in here. There's money to be made. Always will be. And, you know, just use common sense. Ken? Okay. Um, I guess um, my final comments would be is everything we're talking about here is relationships. It's relationships between the plant and the soil, between the biology and the plants, between the biology and the soil, between the plants and the environment in which they're growing. 
it's also true there's a lot of human relationships in what we're talking about and so for me in my business it's all relational as well it's the amount of trust and respect and understanding that i have with the clients that i've been with for 25 years and um it it's a lot easier for me to talk to a farmer about changes in his operation once we've had those relationships like once we built that trust and um i agree with mike there's a lot of things coming down the pipe that are really really good for agriculture but there's a lot of history in agriculture that i would really encourage the young farmers not to forget that history we've learned hard lessons in the last 100 125 years those lessons aren't invalidated by the latest piece of machinery so what we have learned in agriculture for many many years is that yeah change is going to happen but not all change is right and so as mike said i i would say yeah move forward try new things be cautious try them though but try them don't just say well it's not going to work um we used to say that when uh continuous cropping came out leave your, st leave your stubble up right um guys were like you're nuts you'll never be able to grow a crop continuous cropping that'll never work well guess what it worked and we say the same thing about a lot of the new ideas coming out today. They'll never ever work. Truth of the matter is, some of them are going to, and they're gonna make big changes to our agriculture. I'm like Mike, I'm getting to be on the top end of this industry, I'm an older fellow, but don't ever close your mind. Don't ever close your mind and say, no, that's not gonna work. Um, but at the same time, uh, don't make all your decisions just based on the dollar. So um, I know there's some things that you can do that put more dollars in your pocket, but think about are they the right? In the long-term survival of your farm, if you're gonna be on that farm 50 years from now, do the things that you know that are gonna keep you in business 50 years from now and keep you competitive. And yeah. always ask for advice. There's guys like Mike around, there's guys like me around, there's all sorts of farmers in your area who are doing good things. We have very innovative, very smart, very um, good farmers. Talk to your neighbors, get some information, ask questions. There's no, the only question that's really a dumb question is the one you don't bother to ask. So <laughs> I'm excited about the future of agriculture. And uh, I think we've got producers in, in, in Western Canada that are better than anybody else in the world. So um, be encouraged. Yeah, very positive future for agriculture. Yeah. Well, that's great. Yeah, great closing comments. And uh, I love the, uh, you know, <laughs> we've spent 20 years in business as tourists, basically trying to encourage people to have an open mind, you know, and think about things differently. And, you know, it, it could, you know, I mean, obviously farms have grown. Uh, and then there's still farms that are, you know, call it an average size today, they're still very successful in, in the marketplace. And, um, you know, I would challenge any grower or any consultant or any retailer to <clears throat> try something new. Take 50 acres, take what Ken did, you know, the canola and hunter challenge for three years and say, what what is possible? But he, he just didn't go blind. You know, he started by looking at the soil, understanding the rotation, understanding available water and the history of water and uh they take 50 acres take 50 acres of canola in 2021 or take you know a uh, 80 acre a quarter so half of a quarter of uh, barley or oats or or wheat and say what what is possible in my farm but maybe start with an area that you have a better understanding of all these aspects that we need to dial in and say what is possible you know you say maybe we are leaving yield on the table or bushels on the table because we just didn't you know focus on the right uh, components to to pursue yield so anyway great conversation you know i it's it's kind of like any one of these podcasts once you get into it i mean i love it myself i love listening to these guys talk and uh we could go on for another two hours if we wanted but you know we appreciate everybody's time obviously for joining us if you didn't get on or you had to leave early we'll have this podcast available as well on our website and we'll send it out socially there is about 10 or 12 questions we did not get to 
I'll try to post those questions uh, on our website as well under a blog. Um, so you can, you know, we, we get back to you. There is in our Taurus portfolio book, there's an agronomic section that references things like salt index of fertilizers. And there's a question around that. The crop uptake and removal chart, if you don't have that, that's, that's a valuable piece of information. And uh, just good agronomic information around the conductivity with biology is in there too. So uh, a good resource, it's on our website or follow, click on one of the social links to get there. So anyway, with that, uh, you know what? I think uh, we'll wrap her up here. Ken, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, really enjoyed the conversation. And uh, as always, I take... You know, these, these two guys are as passionate as anybody I know in agriculture, and, and obviously their hair is grayer and whiter than mine, and I'd love to be like that when, when I get there. But Yeah, yeah, which, you know, that's what, that's what I love about the industry is to see the passion and the pursuit and, and helping growers be better, and, and that's what makes our industry so, so dynamic and robust. So, so with that, Thanks for joining us. Again, thanks, Ken, for coming on. And, uh, uh, Good luck. you know, uh, yeah, any questions, get in contact with, with us or uh, follow us through uh, one of our social platforms. Okay. Take care. Awesome. Bye -bye. Have a good day.